Over on Jaguar Gator 8, a new college football video is out. In this video, we talk about the 1989 Virginia Tech football team and how a costly decision that they made at the start of the season wound up costing them a spot in a bowl game and $1.2 million. Click the card in the upper right corner to watch. And join me tomorrow night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern, where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes. Link to play below. And now, on with our feature presentation. I'm not sure it's an exaggeration to say that week 14 of the 1980 season was the craziest week in the history of the NFL. If all these things happen over the course of one season, it would be nuts. If all these things happen over the course of a month, it would be insanely impressive. But all these things happen within about 24 hours of each other. You have the Atlanta Falcons practically win the NFC West after defeating the Philadelphia Eagles 20-17 on a game-winning field goal by kicker Tim Mazzetti with no time left. You have the Buffalo Bills defeat the Los Angeles Rams by a final score of 10-7 in overtime after a game-winning field goal by Nick Mickemeyer in a game where the fans stayed for half an hour after the game ended to give their Bills a standing ovation. You had the Cleveland Browns defeat the New York Jets 17-14 after Greg Pruitt scored the game-winning touchdown from five yards out near the end of the game. You had the Chicago Bears annihilate the Green Bay Packers by a final score of 61-7, becoming the first team since 1973 to score 60 points in a game. You had the St. Louis Cardinals, down 23-14 entering the fourth quarter, defeat the Detroit Lions 24-23, thanks to a game-winning punt return touchdown late by Roy Green. You have the Cincinnati Bengals lead the Baltimore Colts 31-6 entering the fourth quarter, only for the Colts to somehow come all the way back and erase the 25-point deficit to take a 33-31 lead, only for the Bengals to win on a 21-yard field goal by Jim Breach with no time left, ruining what would have been the greatest comeback ever. You have the San Francisco 49ers trail the New Orleans Saints 35-7 at the half, before somehow erasing a 28-point deficit and winning it in overtime by a final score of 38-35. And of course, you had the Miami Dolphins defeat the New England Patriots 16-13 on Monday Night Football, with John Lennon's assassination being heard for the first time in the fourth quarter of the contest. All of those things happen on the same week. If there was ever a time to be an NFL fan, it was that week, because that stretch was nothing short of absurd. And I bring all of that up because with all of the craziness going on, it can be very easy for certain stories to fall through the cracks and slip under the radar, even if they might be crazier than the stories that actually got covered. And a game between the 4-9 Seattle Seahawks and the 3-10 New York Giants? Yeah, it's very easy to not pay attention to that, especially when it might be, on paper, the worst and least appealing game of the week, where you're only watching that because that's the game that's been assigned to you and not by choice. However, that might have been the craziest game of them all, and not because of anything that happened on the field, but rather because of what happened off of it. Because after the game, the New York Giants came close to ceasing to exist. The entire team almost died, all because of a near plane crash that came literally two minutes away from happening. If you ever wonder what would happen in a disaster scenario, the NFL almost had to execute that plan in 1980, after the cross-country flight from hell. This is the story behind what has to be, of the thousands upon thousands of plane rides, the craziest one of them all, in the over-century-long history of the National Football League. Before I talk about the incident in question on the way back from the game, we need some context to understand how the game itself went, because prior to this moment, it was actually a very joyous occasion for the Giants in what was an extremely rough season. It's December 7th, 1980, and we have an interconference matchup on our hands at the Kingdom between the Seattle Seahawks and the New York Giants. I can't even say anything about the importance of this game, because it was completely non-existent. It was irrelevant. The Seahawks entered this one at 4-9, while the Giants entered this one at 3-10. Both of these teams were absolutely putrid, and both sets of fans were just hoping for the merciful end of the season to come sooner rather than later. The Seahawks had a point differential of minus 96, which was the worst in the AFC, and they boasted an abysmal defense that allowed 335 points through 13 games, which was an average of just under 26 points per game, and was the second worst average in the conference. As a side note, if you want to learn more about just how bad the Seahawks were in 1980, 
including maybe the worst performance on Thanksgiving ever, click the card in the upper right corner. And the Giants were no better. Their point differential of minus 163 was the second worst in the NFL, only ahead of the New Orleans Saints, who were winless. Their 355 points allowed was the second worst total in the conference, and their 192 points scored was also the second worst total in the conference. In other words, this game was a battle between two absolutely terrible teams that had nothing to play for, and someone had to win it. However, as is usually the case with games between two really bad teams, the badness cancels each other out, and you get a fairly entertaining contest that, as a neutral fan, is fun to watch, even if it means nothing in the grand scheme of things. With two minutes left in the contest, the Giants were trailing 21 to 20, and were faced with a difficult decision on fourth and one. Do you try the 47-yard field goal and let Joe Danello try to kick you ahead, or do you go for it and trust your offensive line to do enough to get a yard and keep the drive alive? Well, head coach Ray Perkins decided to leave his offense out there, and he went for it, with the play being a handoff to third-year running back Billy Taylor. And he didn't just get one yard, he got 30, and found the end zone to give the Giants a lead, 27-21 lead, which is the score that they eventually won the game with. This season had been a rough one for the Giants, having lost five straight road games and having started off 1-8. However, this come-from-behind win, especially since it meant that they won three of their last five games, inspired some confidence in what was an otherwise terrible year. Overall, it was an incredibly closely contested contest. The Seahawks had 337 yards of total offense compared to 311 for the Giants. Both teams turned it over twice, and the Seahawks had 70 yards lost by penalties compared to 68 for the Giants. However, it was a great win for New York, especially after they blew a 13-0 lead early in the contest. Flying from Seattle to Newark, New Jersey is never fun. It's a long flight that usually takes somewhere in the ballpark of 5 hours if everything goes according to plan, which if you've ever flown before, especially this year, you know that's usually not the case. However, it's a lot easier to fly, and the time goes by much faster after you won the game versus after you lost. But this flight that the Giants were about to embark on was no ordinary flight. Because on this day, the biggest win that the Giants had wasn't on the field. Rather, the biggest win they had was the fact that they could land in Newark. Because I am not exaggerating when I say that the plane came seconds away from coming down, potentially killing the entire team and coaching staff in the process. After the Giants packed everything up and boarded their plane to go from Seattle to Newark, everything seemed like it was business as usual. This was a United Airlines DC-8 jet, which was not exactly the safest plane in the world as of lately, seeing as there is an entire lengthy Wikipedia page devoted to accidents where the DC-8 malfunctioned, went down, and killed people. There were multiple crashes already in 1980, and twice in the last three years, people died on United Airlines flights on board the DC-8 including Flight 2860, where three crew members died, and Flight 173, where 10 people died. Still, this was the aircraft responsible for taking home the Giants, and for flying them across the country. Get them from Seattle, and to New Jersey in one piece, and mission accomplished. That was the goal for Flight 5060, carrying 103 passengers and 8 crew members. However, about 40 minutes into the flight, it looked like that was not going to happen. Because 40 minutes after they took off from Seattle, there was a problem with the primary hydraulic system, as there was a leak. And yes, there are safeguards in place and backup systems in place, just in case things break down. But leaks are the one thing that can't really be accounted for, at least not on this plane. If there's a leak, there's going to be trouble, especially in the number 2 engine. Of the four engines on the DC-8, the number 2 engine was the most important as it carried the primary hydraulic pump, which controls just about everything from the landing gear, to the wing flaps, to the brakes. As Benjamin Slavin, the FAA Chief of Operations, said on the importance of this engine, if there is any leak in the hydraulic system, it will affect the landing gear. One thing that can't be tolerated is a high leak rate. In other words, if you were on this plane, and you heard that there was a problem with this engine, you knew you were in some big trouble. The engine was leaking so fast that all the fluid from the pump was coming out, and Jack Wink, who piloted the plane, 
said on this, at the time, we did not know if the loss would affect the landing gear, the flaps, the brakes, or all of them. We had to make preparations for a possible emergency landing. Now, I'm not an expert in planes whatsoever, so perhaps someone in the comments can explain why they did this. Because just from the surface, this looks like one of the dumbest decisions imaginable. However, the crew recognized the problem 40 minutes after leaving Seattle. There were still over 4 hours left, and the fluid was only going to continue to leak out. So you would think that the pilots would try and land the plane somewhere so that the problem could get fixed, and maybe they could bring in another plane. You don't want this plane flying across the country if you don't know what's wrong with it. However, for some reason that is inexplicable to me, but may or may not be inexplicable to someone who knows more about this stuff than I do, they continued to fly the plane. The DC-8 was preparing to land in Newark, even despite this problem. Oh, and I should also note that no one on board, from the players, to the coaches, to the reporters who tagged along, had any idea that this was happening until 45 minutes before the plane was set to touch down in Newark. And as the plane was nearing its approach, the pilot alarmed the passengers on board and told them to prepare for a crash landing. All of a sudden, things got extremely real, especially after members of the flight crew told the Giants to brace for emergency landing and went over how to do everything, from what doors to use to what to do in case of a fire. Emergency vehicles and fire trucks from the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey were dispatched on the runway, and just about everyone was preparing for the worst with some players thinking about saying their goodbyes and who they were going to save. Head coach Ray Perkins said that even though he didn't necessarily show it, he was worried deep down. Defensive end Gary Jeter said, When we saw all those lights from emergency vehicles near the field, there was nothing funny about it anymore. Offensive tackle Vern Holland said, What I was thinking about as we were heading down was who I would save first. Hunter Dave Jennings said that quarterback Phil Sims had to have his hand held the whole way down because he was so worried, as Sims said that he was anxiously waiting for the announcement that they were going to crash. And running back Nate Rivers said, I wasn't so sure that the problem could be rectified. I was preparing myself mentally just in case I had to jump in the water. You had a crew that knew there was something wrong with the plane, but couldn't identify the problem until seconds before touchdown. You had over 100 passengers on board, with many of them expecting the worst. And you had a plane that was going down and was going to go down hard. Nothing about this entire situation seemed even the slightest bit positive. If you thought that Billy Taylor's game-winning fourth quarter touchdown with two minutes left was going to be the biggest touchdown of the day for the Giants, that touchdown in the game was quickly irrelevant. Because the way more important touchdown was the touchdown that this plane was attempting to make. And fortunately for everyone involved, Despite the pump being completely out of fluid, despite a complete failure of the hydraulic system, despite the passengers being in the crash landing position, and despite the emergency vehicles being dispatched on the runway, at 1.37 a.m., the plane landed at Newark International Airport with no injuries. It was a miracle. Even if the landing was a bit rocky, as the pilot had to reverse the engines harder than usual to prevent the plane from rolling off the runway, everything turned out okay and somehow, the plane landed safely. What could have been a complete disaster of a situation, had the pilots not located the problem literally two minutes before landing the plane, turned into just a bizarre flight story. And for those wondering, yes, Ray Perkins had his team show up to the facility the next day for team meetings and treatment, although he was generous enough to delay it by an hour, since it was not exactly a smooth night for anyone involved. But still, no days off. But 120 seconds was the difference between life and potentially death, or at the very least, serious injuries. If the pilots didn't locate the problem moments before touching down in Newark, everything would have changed, and who knows what the casualties and aftermath would have been. With all the crazy stuff that happened in week 14 of the 1980 season, it was super easy for not a lot of people to pay attention to this. Heck, because this news happened overnight, People didn't find out about it in the papers until Tuesday, December 9th, when anything that wasn't John Lennon's assassination was a complete afterthought. However, this might have been one of the craziest near disasters in NFL history. Because in 1980, even though the Giants only won four games, they had the biggest win of any team that season, when they survived what could have been a deadly, 
deadly plane crash. Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at Jaguar9. To see college football videos, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping get the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.